So in this segment of the cell membrane transport, we're going to continue our discussion of active transport, but now we're specifically going to be focusing on secondary active transport. And so once we complete this, you'll be able to compare and contrast primary active transport with secondary active transport. Just a reminder, okay, we're going to be focusing over here on secondary active transport, which is going to be involving organic molecules such as glucose and ions such as sodium. So in secondary active transport, one ion moves down its concentration gradient, meaning it moves along its gradient, right, from a high concentration to a low concentration. And that's going to cause another ion or a molecule to move against its gradient. So I always envision it this way. All right, so if we have our two hill analogy again, and we have our one solute on top of the hill, and then over here we have a different solute at the bottom of the hill. So one ion, right, moves down its gradient. A lot of times this is sodium that moves down its gradient. And when it moves down its gradient, that's going to release energy. So this is an indirect energy. We're not using ATP. We're not hydrolyzing ATP to do this. It's just the release of energy from this ion moving down its gradient that actually produces or creates the energy to drive the other ion or molecule up its gradient. So without having the ion going down its concentration gradient, you cannot cause the other ion to move up its gradient, okay? So again, the most common ion we're gonna be dealing with here is sodium. Sodium typically moves down its concentration gradient. And keep in mind that it's movement down this gradient, and it's an electrochemical gradient, that releases the energy that drives another ion or a molecule against its gradient. Then we have two different types. We have co-transport, which is also called symport. And then you have counter-transport, which is also called antiport. And so when you think of these names, what you're trying to think about is what direction do the solutes move? Not thinking in terms of their concentration gradient, but just what overall direction. So co means together, right? And so does sim. So this means that both solutes move in the same direction. If it's counter-transport, right? or antiport means opposite. So the solutes are moving in opposite directions. Now here is a crucial point, okay? Again, we're talking about their general direction that they move. Do they both move into the cell? The principle that one ion still needs to move along a gradient and the other one is gonna move against a gradient, that principle still holds. But the gradients may be such that both solutes are moving in the same direction, but they are following that rule. One's going along a gradient, one's going against a gradient. Same thing for counter-transport. These solutes may be moving in opposite directions, but one of those is still going along a gradient and the other one is still going against a gradient. And you'll have an opportunity to work some examples here in just a moment. And so down below in this table, these are just some examples of secondary active transporters that we'll be talking about throughout the semester. So here's an example of secondary active transport. And so once again, get kind of get your bearings here. Where, where are we? Here's the lumen of the intestine or the kidney. Okay, here's some intracellular fluid here. And then we have this carrier protein, the SGLT. So secondary active transport does require a carrier protein. And so let's take a look at what's gonna happen. So sodium comes in, it binds to the carrier. So this carrier represents or illustrates the concept of specificity. So sodium is moving from a high concentration toward a low concentration. So we're gonna put low sodium over here. Glucose then is moving from a low concentration toward a high concentration. Okay, so now I've got to think about this. When sodium binds, it's going from high to low. So that's creating the energy to drive glucose from low to high. All right, so when sodium binds, that's going to create your site for glucose. When you create the site for glucose and glucose can bind, the carrier changes shape 
and then sodium and glucose both get released into the intracellular fluid. So both of these solutes are going into the intracellular fluid. However, sodium is going along its gradient, glucose is going against. But despite all of that, you would define this as symport or co-transport. So we would call this a sodium glucose co-transport. So these types of co-transport or counter-transport, those terms or those types of active transport only apply to secondary active transport. So here I've listed the concentrations of sodium as well as some solute X. Okay, that could be an organic molecule, molecule or it could be another ion. So we want to figure out which direction is X going to move if we assume this is co-transport with sodium. Okay, so co-transport automatically means it's secondary active transport. So that means that one ion, like sodium here, and it's already showing you, sodium's going high to low. Therefore, that's creating the energy to drive X, whatever it may be, from low to high. So this is low X toward a high X. And it was the energy that was generated, or what we call indirect energy, to drive X from low to high. So since both sodium and X are moving into the cell, this would be an example of symport. Okay, here's our next example. So now we're gonna deal with sodium is again. However, we're gonna deal with Y, a new solute named Y. So Y has a low concentration inside the cell and high on the outside. So if you'd like to pause the video to figure out which direction Y is going to move, please do so. So if sodium is going from high to low, we know that we're dealing with secondary active transport. Therefore, you know your other solute has to be moving from low to high. 